Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Friday, January 19th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you as our position preview series rolls along. This is episode four in the series already. Busy week for us as we move on to the first base position. Uh, I think we left yesterday's show talking about the A's depth chart and uh, trying to figure out why it smelled like soup in my house. So, And there was no soup. There is that the no conclusion? Soup. That was, was the no conclusion. Soup? None. What happened when you went downstairs and said, where's the soup? They just looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Which is why I think I need to go see a doctor. I think I'm okay. I just want to be sure that I'm okay. But a lot of ground well, to we cover. We are fully prepared to talk a lot about Jake Bowers today. We'll just name this the Jake Bowers podcast, I think, at a time. That's probably where the episode ends. Some <laughs> some place around a Jake Bowers conversation and me being upset about the Brewers' uh, first base situation. But plenty of teams have great first base situations, and that's where we're going to focus the beginning of the show. Uh, Freddie Freeman. Leads off tier one. He's a solid first rounder at this point. It seemed like for years he was the guy that people would reluctantly take at the end of round one. Oh, I drew the 14th, 15th pick. I guess I'll take Freddie Freeman. And he just keeps getting better. Uh, has one of the most unusual career progressions and stolen bases that I've ever seen. <laughs> 23 bags last year, even with the new rules. That just seems absolutely ridiculous. This is a guy that can win batting titles. He can lead the league and run scored. And it's pretty wild. He took a very different path to being a $40 player by the auction calculator than the number two first baseman, Matt Olson. Olson did it with just ridiculous power. Freeman did it with extreme categorical balance. In the first seven years of his career, Freddie Freeman stole 21 bags. <laughs> yeah, when he was a young man. Didn't run at all. He's a young man. And now he's old. He's like a 20, 20 first baseman. I, uh, I, you know, I do feel bad for projection systems almost. We've been talking about the difficulty of projecting <laughs> stolen bases this year. And in my mailbag that's out today, someone said, well, are we going to see more stolen bases next year or fewer as teams spend more time trying to suppress stolen bases on, you know, suppressing the running game? And my theory is more but uh, eventually at a lower success rate. So, for example, at third base, uh, teams are 85% successful. And the break-even rate is, I think, less than 75% on that proposition. So they're going to steal more and get caught more as they push that line. And then as it gets closer to 80% or whatever, then we'll maybe see a slowing down. But I would assume there's going to be more stolen bases in this coming season than there was last year. And since that's true, you take a projection like Freddie Freeman, 13 stolen bases on the regular rules, 23 on this, you know, 34 years old. And I think the system is just saying, you know, uh, I'm going to regress him. I'm going to put an age thing on there. I'm just going to look at the last few years of stolen bases and I'm going to pump out 13. But my sort of theory is why not 18 to 20 again? I don't know why not. Like, I don't think he's going to be much slower. And even then, speed is not basically the main skill that allows him to steal bags. Right. I, I just think it's it's... Being opportunistic, he yeah. picks the spots very carefully, and it's reflected in the success rates that we've seen. Even if he were to drop back into the twelve to fifteen range, fine. Like he's going to be non-zero like plus plus in batting average. He's going to be at least good in power, and those runs and RBIs are gonna just going to keep coming in bunches. So I, I think he belongs at the top of this group by just a small, small margin. I, I, I think it's it, there's enough there. There's so many ways he can make that value. I think Matt Olson is really interesting for some different reasons. And you're doing some digging before the show. If you're watching on YouTube, we've got a, a rolling chart here with the strikeout rate for Matt Olson. And he showed us this level in 2021 that I didn't think we'd ever see again. But it was it certainly reason to believe that the, the heavier swing and miss that we saw earlier in his career was gone. That that had been corrected. And you start to look at this this second half that Matt Olson put together as part of a monster year. And he was kind of trending back towards that 2021 level of strikeout rate. So I'm starting to wonder if we could see a sub 20% K rate season from Matt Olson. Again, it was 23.2% in this monster 2023 you know, power went through the roof career high 54 home runs, but I, I don't know. I, I didn't see 
one more level coming from Matt Olson, and he did it. Yeah, it's he's uh, he's amazing in just the adjustments he's made. I mean, I think one adjustment he pointed out to me that was really important to him that um, he pointed out to me earlier um, last season was um, that he kind of did the uh, the adjustment that Marcus Simeon did, where he found a way to you know track ride on on the four seam and then uh kind of swing uh a, you know above it uh to meet it flush and since then he's been amazing um at uh at hitting the four seam i mean you can look at the pitch type values which are not they're kind of a blunt instrument they they just kind of take everything that happens on that pitch and and puts it together but for hitters it gives you a little bit of a quick look um, into what they're good at. And early in his career, Matt Olson was a scratch fastball hitter, minus minus even for the first three years. And then he was like an okay guy. And then 2021, he thinks that's sort of when he made the adjustment. He becomes like a near league leader. And then last year, I think he led the league in, in fastball run value. Um, and so, you know, that's been a good thing. But I mentioned to him, like, where, how does this go hand in hand with uh, some of your strikeout rates? So 2021 is the first year you make that adjustment. You had a 17% strikeout rate, and that was the best of your career. And since then, it's been going up a little bit. And he's like, well, every adjustment kind of has a, a, a back and forth. And so the what happened was when I got so much better at high four seams, I, I kind of wanted to hit them. I kind of started to look for them because that's I could do damage on them. And he said that opens up the bottom of the zone, you know, for uh, for sliders. And so on that graph uh, that we just had up there, you know, you know, once one thing that's not easily put on that graph, but is true, is that with every month of last season, he swung at fewer sliders. Hmm. And so that's why in the graph you saw his strikeout rate going back down again. So I, I, I just wonder if Matt Olson has like, you know, another season in him with like a 18% strikeout rate, you know? Yeah. We yeah. Together this like fastball mentality with also spitting on fat on, on sliders. And if that's true, then he's one of those rare situations where super valuable player was super valuable last year you want to bake in some regression, but maybe there's some progression where he's going to get better in some ways. Uh, at 29, it's still possible to see a career year, quote unquote. I don't know if, how much better you could be than last year, but like maybe a little bit different where it's 290 or 300 with 45 homers. And if he does that, it would be near a 400 OBP. And if he does that, he's going to repeat those runs on RBI on that, on that Braves uh, lineup. So Um, I think it's a, it's, I think he's almost safer than Freeman because Freeman is uh, 34 years old and has a, a a push the ball mentality. Um, you know, he's not a pull guy. So those barrels are pushed and, you know, I think there could be a season where, you know, Freeman only hits 22 homers. I mean, he did that in 22 to 2022. Uh, whereas, uh, maybe for Olsen, the error bars are in the positive direction. Yeah. I guess if you said, Olsen doing even 85 for someone who did this past season with a better batting average versus Freeman getting back to the 2022 levels of output. You probably would prefer Olsen if you knew that was going to be the outcome, but uh, uh, interesting, yeah. interesting don't case. Know. <laughs> no, no things like that, but yeah, no, exactly. Super interesting case though, for the possibility of Olsen actually being better than Freeman this year. And, and even the next option here, Bryce Harper. I mean, Bryce Harper, a first base really suits him. He, he just looked right at that position and mm-hmm. it took him a little while to get going coming off the the surgery but he hit 300 with a 413 obp and a 575 slug popped 18 homers and stole six bases from july 1st on and really easy to look at that and say okay that mid 30s maybe 40 home run powers there he's got some speed and it makes sense because he's not a, a lumbering first baseman he's a former outfielder who just moved to the position i i, I could I could look at Harper and say, maybe I still prefer Harper to Olsen, even though Olsen just did some amazing things last year. And it's not even a knock on Olsen. It's just that that belief that Harper is even one notch better. And we've seen we've seen longer runs with a little less swing and miss from Harper in the past. So that's part of where my confidence in Harper comes from, too. Just a, a longer track record of being at this elite sort of level. Yeah, 
I wonder if we're, uh, this seems like uh, the middle of a Hall of Fame career. Um, I, the 580 slugging in the second half makes me think Harper has more coming forward. I think Olsen versus Harper is a, is a really interesting discussion because you are going to get more steals. And it, it seems like folly even for somebody of Olsen's caliber to be like, yeah, he's going to hit 45 homers again. It's just not something that's been done a lot in this environment. You know, Pete Alonso is the, is a kind that kind of does 40, you know, repeatedly. Um, but that's why the projections have Olsen falling back to the mid thirties. And if, if he just plays to his projections, um, then Harper, you know, is Olsen's equal probably. And, uh, you know, you can tell the story of, well, the projections are missing that he got healthy in the second half. So, um, I, I think I do have a Harper after Olsen. Um, but I, I see why they're going basically at the same spot. Yeah, they are a legitimate toss up with the likes of Jordan Alvarez, uh, Corey Seager. Interesting that other than Harper, most of those guys don't give you much of anything in the stolen base category. Even Austin Riley, who we talked about on our third base preview, he's kind of in that cluster. Top of that group is Jose Ramirez, the guy who runs the most of those five players. Mm-hmm. So a really decent spot to be if you're in a 15 team league, you could pair two of those hitters together and have a really nice foundation. And if one of them is Ramirez, then you feel pretty good speed wise. You're not chasing there as much. But even if you if you skipped it, if you skipped the bags and felt good about some of those early middle round middle infielders we've talked about, there you go. That could be a heck of a foundation for this year uh, as well. You're not really pushing pitching in that group. Garrett Cole kind of falls to the back of the first round. You'd be jumping Corbin Burns up a few spots if you were going to take him over but those you can definitely pair Cole or Burns with one of these guys if you want to do the one hitter, one pitcher thing. Yep. Yeah, so there's lots of things you can do at the back of round one if you Harper do draw seems to a late keep spot. Your stat, like your, your, you keep your options. Like Harper and Ramirez, I think, keep your options open later. Yes. Don't get you pigeonholed in any way. I would agree with that. Uh, I think I would prefer... Prefer at least one of those guys as opposed to the scenario outlined where you would go basically zero bags with two hitters. I think that's cutting it just a little bit too. I mean, Seager and Olsen would be super exciting, but yeah, you'd have to go really stolen base heavy pretty soon after that. And and then you also become predictable in the draft. (laughs) Some people know what you've done early on and know you're looking for steals, you know, and they can either you know, pick someone right before you that has steals or, you know, you know, know that they can, t- they can wait on guys without steals because you won't take them. Yep. That could definitely be used against you. Pete Alonzo is part of this tier goes in the later part of round two and Vlad juniors there as well. Olsen and like, Olsen versus Alonzo in past draft seasons was something that would have been probably a legitimate debate. They had pretty similar skills entering the year and probably even, more reason going into last season to think that Alonzo would out earn Olsen just because we saw Pete Alonzo with a lower K percentage in 2022. I had a wrist injury last year, still got to the power a lot. I think it was 46 homers for Alonzo, but he hit 217. So there's this downside that kind of pushes Alonzo into a almost a Kyle Schwarber sort of roto value. But I don't think that's him though. I, I yeah. think I think this was the function of an injury. I think the the longer track record here suggest that Alonzo does better on balls in play than some of the lower average mashers. And this is kind of a, an extreme outlier season. The weird thing is we're just not getting that much of a discount on Alonzo. The market's looking at that and saying, no, nah, polar bears coming all the way back and it's 40 plus homers with at least a 260 average, possibly more. And he keeps doing it in a difficult place to hit for power, too, yeah. which makes you think that you know, beyond his time with the Mets, if he leaves either via midseason trade or free agency, there could still be more levels for Pete Alonso in the future. Yeah, I think mean, some part of his lower BABIP is due to his fly ball rate. It's it's an extreme fly ball rate. Um, and so he has a 259 BABIP for his career. But even if you just give him his career 259 BABIP, he's going to be 250 plus. I guess, you know, that's not quite as valuable as Olsen, who I think is going to be better than 250 plus. But, um, you know, there is some you can wait around basically or wait 10 picks. Um, Alonzo is like the Olsen you get uh, if you picked at the beginning of the first round. Yep. Yeah, if you had a top five pick, you're looking at Alonzo coming back against some of the the aces, the likes of Gossman, Wheeler, 
Luis Castillo, uh, against a guy like Marcus Simeon, against someone like Francisco Lindor or Rafael Devers. He belongs in that that group. I just I wish I was getting a little more of a discount, but I would have no problem taking Alonzo in that spot. Probably would be more inclined to pair him with, with like Corbin Carroll. That's probably yeah, what I would want. Like, because, I mean, if you had the first pick, it'd be a great, you know, it'd be a great pick to put up against Acuna, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would work just fine as well. Julio Rodriguez, nice pairing with that, maybe. Although Rodriguez uh strikes out a fair amount, so you know, you may have some batting average risk with that pairing. Yeah, something to keep in mind. But I, I just specifically around that turn in 15 teamers, you're going to have this choice where you probably went bat in the first five. Yeah, you definitely went bat in the first five. I don't I doubt you'd take Strider in the first five. You went bat in the first five. And you have this knowledge that there's kind of like a, a top five or six mini tier, you know, among starting pitchers. And you may have one of those guys available to you. And then you also have Pete Alonso staring at you and you kind of want to take Pete Alonso, but that might cost you in terms of your third pick in terms of what you might be able to get with a starting pitcher. And the, the reason why I would say I might wait on Pete Alonso has nothing to do with Pete Alonso himself but has rather to do with the presence of Vladimir Guerrero Jr., yep. who, by steamer projections, is the second best first baseman. <laughs> now, I know you can almost like roll your eyes a little bit at that projection uh, because it's like the second year in a row that steamer is projecting him for mid-30s homers and would be the second year in a row we, we wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, but I think just even if you lop five homers off of that and you're talking about a 290, you know, 285, 290 hitter with 32 homers and five stolen bases, I think value wise, that's pretty close to Pete Alonso. It's a different package, but it's pretty close value wise. And so the presence of those two guys and the knowledge that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is dropping in drafts and that even that sort of 30 ish ADP that, uh, that I've been looking at, that I'm looking at right now, I think that's soft. I got in our draft, and this is a draft and hold, and you know it's 50 rounds and it's a whole deal. I got him uh, in the mid third, so we're talking uh, 39th. So. I couldn't ignore the fact that like he was like five dollars clear of everybody else I was looking at <laughs> in terms of auction value. I know um, I, I wouldn't necessarily. This this is a way, sort of a lesson how to use these rankings and how to use those projections. I think is you don't necessarily need to take Vladimir Guerrero as the second first baseman if nobody else is treating him that way. Right. But if your numbers are treating him that way and you get to a point where you're like. Dang, I got Vladimir. I got a choice between Vladimir Guerrero, who's a $29 player by Steamer, and the best other player on the board is like a Randy Rosarena um, or Royce Lewis went that round. Wow. Um, Randy Rosarena or Adolis Garcia. You know, those are $20 players. So if I'm like almost $10 clear, of the other players, then I'm going to, I guess I'm just going to take them. It's like a, it's I, what I call to myself a projections play. It's just like, I'm just going to take them because the projections say I should, you know, I don't do that for every pick, but in this case, I think it's, a, it's an okay way to go. Even if you decided to close the gap and say Alonzo and Vlad are worth basically the same dollar value wise, and they get, they take slightly different paths to get there. The drop off from the starters, like the Gossmans, the Wheelers, the Castillos, down to the next tier where you get to you know, Pablo Lopez, George Kirby, Zach Gallon, Tyler Glasnell. For a lot of people, that's a bigger difference than I the difference between two first basemen. So, right, so you take a pitcher, the four, six, eight picks, whatever it is before your next turn comes up in round three happen, there's a decent enough chance that one of Alonzo or more likely Vlad is still there. And if one of them isn't there, you may still have someone else you like. Could be Gunnar Henderson, could be Michael Harris, you know, could be Robert. Royce be, Lewis in the third, I guess. <laughs> right. There's just a few ways it can break still in your favor. So I think that's that's what you have to consider as far as like taking Alonzo versus passing on him. Uh, I will say that in auction formats, he's a target for me. 
he's a very, very clear target for me, dollars for dollar. Uh, I want to emphasize power in my base this year because I, I think this is Vlad you're talking about. Alonzo. I, I like I like Vlad, but I just think Alonzo is one of those guys where if they're both going to go for 27, 28, I'd actually rather have Alonzo than Vlad for this year only. I think the fair question to ask about Vlad is if <laughs> is 2021 an outlier or do we just say, hey, you know what? He's 25 in March and <laughs> there's a very good chance we haven't seen his best season yet, even though that season really jumps off the page compared to and otherwise very good, but not quite elite body of work. Fair. <laughs> okay. We can move on to tier two. This group is actually kind of small, really only three guys who are first base only Cody Bellinger is part of it. We're going to have him in the outfield episode. So we're going to focus on Christian Walker, Paul Goldschmidt and Tristan Cassis. So this is uh, Wait, a, not Cody Bellinger. We're we putting him in the outfield. I was going to put him in the outfield. Okay. Do you feel a, an urgent need to talk about him today, though? We can do it. No, it's fine. I just okay. That's a quick search. <laughs> yeah, it works either way. Uh, Christian Walker, I think, is kind of an answer to the question that came up on the show a few episodes ago. You know, why do teams take chances on the 25 and 26-year-olds who crush AAA? Because sometimes you end up with Christian Walker, and he's been really, really good in Arizona, showing some longer-term improvement in strikeout rate that I think gives him a better like more ace, a uh, more graceful aging curve than I would have expected when he was a prospect just crushes the power categories, 33 homers, 103 RBIs, 86 runs scored last year. And he chipped in 11 bags. He was 11 for 11 as a base dealer. Another first baseman who got in on the, everybody can get bags last year. I, I look for flaws in everybody and I don't really see one in Christian Walker. He's going to be 33 in March. So yeah, maybe I mean, that's, there's your age. Flaw. Age is the only thing, but swing decisions are good. K rate's not a problem. He's patient enough. I mean, like there's just there's a lot to like here. He still hits the ball pretty hard. Forty percent hard hit with eleven point two percent barrel rate. I don't know why I, the I don't OBP anybody is pushing him for playing time. Why isn't the OBP higher? It's a little bit strange. Mm. Three fifteen, three twenty seven, three thirty three for the last three years for Christian Walker. Uh, the walk rates are okay. The chase rates are okay. The BABIP is not great, but. I guess the it's... BABIP took a one-year dip in 22, so the average in OBP came down with it. He probably, with it, with just his normal career mark, would have had more like a 340, 350 OBP that year. Hit 348 yeah. back in 19. So projections could be a tad light, sometimes, but they seem appropriate. Sometimes he gets uh, a little bit too fly ball-y. I've even talked to him about that. And uh, the nice thing is that when I talk to him about it, he's like, yeah, when I do get too fly ball-y, like... I get in the, the cage and try to flatten out my swing a little bit. So he doesn't like he's there's times when you look at his board and you're like, oh, you've got a 50 percent fly ball rate. And he's like, yeah, I don't I don't love it when I'm there. And that's, I think, good news because he's not, you know, going to go into that Pete Alonzo territory where he's got a 240 or 250 Babbitt. He's got a 283 career Babbitt, you know. So it's a little bit more of a uh, I'll get some line drives with my homers, please, as opposed to Pete Alonso kind of be like just homers and, and then more homers. It's so weird that after Vlad Jr., kind of in that middle part around three at the later end, you jump down almost 50 picks before you get to this group. Bellinger bridges a gap. He's there 20 picks after Vlad Jr., but again, first base and outfield eligible. But Goldie, Walker, and Cassis That's, all go within a few picks of each other. This is a clear group that you have to choose from if you're taking a first baseman in that kind of mid-round six range. And I think, you know, I, I think that the choice could be uh, could be Cassis, but I'm going to uh, give a, a little bit of love to Goldschmidt as possibly being the pick out of the three. First, again, uh, projections have him as the best. Um, and then second, uh, I could see uh, there being some way that he outplays his projections. Um, you know, I think I have a... Uh, Put it up on the board, please. Oh, yeah, have. you have the uh, this one right here. And what you're seeing, if you're watching on YouTube, is Paul Goldschmidt's um, 30 game rolling average for fly balls and pull, uh, pulled fly balls. And the reason I have this up there is Goldschmidt started his career as an oppo guy, a Freddie Freeman esque guy, but uh, from the right side, uh, that looked to kind of go opposite field 
um, with power. And I think there was a big explosion for him power wise when he learned to also pull his fly balls uh, and, and kind of add that to the package. You see in 2021 and 2022 that his pull and fly ball rates are high. And then you see in 2023 that they uh, start to drop off. He's, his fly ball rate uh, remains high for longer, but the pull rate really drops off. And I think that's a big part of why he had a, a poor year last year. Two reasons for hope. The end of the season, you start to see the pull and fly ball rates come back up. And then the second is uh, bat speed training in the offseason. Uh, just a real uh, attempt like Arenado um, to and others before and Mookie Betts who we've talked about to turn to bat speed training uh, to stave off some of the normal aging patterns. So the projections which say he's the best of the three do not account for that. Um, and if we get a season with a 220, 230 ISO next year from Paul Goldschmidt, that'd be totally in the realm of possibility. And that would be beating the projections. So what I like about this is I see a story where I can buy him in a good spot for his projections. And there's a story as to why there might be more than the projections have. Yeah, I think when you look at what happened last year, the down year for Goldschmidt, much like the down year for Arenado, was still really good. A 50.7% hard hit rate for Goldschmidt last year, 40.1% for Walker. I think that gives you that, that extra nudge and average that would probably make Goldschmidt the slightly better option. Uh, I think Walker deserves to be in this tier, but I think Walker versus Cassis is actually a more difficult decision for me. Like I'm taking Goldschmidt of the three every single time and redraft. With Cassis, you know, he did a great job. He had a small sample ground ball spike when he debuted in 2022. That wasn't a problem last year. Showed pretty good patience. K rate wasn't bad at 25%. Barrel rate jumped up to 13%. The counting stats fell short of a lot of the guys around him because he only had 502 plate appearances. There was some shoulder inflammation at the end of the season that, that cost him some time. And earlier in the year, he was playing a little bit less against lefties. But from, I think, August 1st on, when he was healthy, there was only one time the Red Sox faced a left-handed starter and they took him out of the lineup. So it looks mm. like the the trust level letting him play in those spots might actually be there. But I think that's the the little kernel of doubt that I have about Cassis is just playing time relative to Goldschmidt, Walker, and even some of the guys that are at the top of the next year if the Red Sox decide they don't want to play him all the time against lefties. He could leak a little bit of playing time in that split. Well, I, I like that he found his ground ball fly ball mix from the minors um, after, you know, his debut with too many grounders. Um, and, and that's, an, again, once again, the lesson where, you know, you got to look to the minor league ground ball fly ball numbers before you declare someone, you know, a worm killer. And then the, the second part is um, you can see in the numbers a little bit more aggression. And that's something that Tristan himself highlighted for me when, when I talked to him was you know, part of pulling the ball, part of hitting for power, part of hitting better for him was being more aggressive. So you see the reach rate, the chase rate go up um, from between his debut and the next year. But I think it was all positive because with that came a big boost in swinging at pitches inside the zone and hard hit and pull percentage and fly balls. So that aggression, you know, paired well. And so I think, you know, you know, his rookie season, I know is a small, you know, sample, but like 20% walk rate, 24% strikeout rate, that might not actually be the best version of Cassis. You know, getting that down to more of a 12 to 13% walk rate means that he's being more aggressive. He's hitting for power. I think he did all the things I wanted him to do. I believe in him. It's just, you know, he's not going to steal bases. And Walker's probably going to steal five plus. You know, <laughs> is either one of these guys like, oh, yeah, that guy's going to hit 290 or 280? I don't see that. So then you're comparing power numbers, and, you know, it's a 13% barrel rate, 113 max EV uh, for Cassis, and uh, it's a 12, 11% barrel rate, 114 max EV for Walker, but also a demonstrated ability to get to that power. That, yeah. well, that Cassis hasn't got. So, like, in other words, uh, Walker last year hit 258 with 33 homers and 11 stolen bases. That would be a great year for Cassis. Right. If you're banking and on the full And he's probably not going to steal those bases anyway. I've, 
I, I thought I thought we found rock bottom for sprint speed for someone at age 24 when we looked at Isak Paredes yesterday, but uh, Tristan Cassis, sixth percentile in sprint speed. Oh, <laughs> it's six oh. five. He's a big guy, so it's fine. Yeah, he's, he's a lumbering giant. He's but he's hanging out with the catchers down there. But that's that's fine in the sense that like if if Cassis. Can Cassis be more like a Matt Olson type player in the long run? Not in 2024, but does he have the foundational skills, the swing decisions, lifting the ball, pulling the ball, the right mix? Does he have that sort of approach where we're going to see him sort of make this ascent up to the early rounds and eventually make a run at being a lead at this position? I want to see more pull from him. And then and, and even pushing that barrel rate into the sort of 14, 15, 16% rate. Um, I'm not sure that I see, especially with the pull rates he's shown in the minors and so far in the majors, I'm not sure I see 40 plus. This seems like a guy who's going to spray around a little bit more than that and be more of like a 260, 30 guy, 230, maybe 35 homers. I wonder how much home park, you know, being able to go oppo at Fenway and use the monster, how much that, that could influence his approach didn't look like he Red went Sox. bonkers doing that last year though i mean i did have i did have players tell me that they they don't um uh, you know think about the park and don't try to you know fashion their game to the park but it is it is true still that boston red Sox lefties um were league leaders in i, I forget exactly if it was first or second or third but league leaders types in going oppo and Boston Red Sox righties uh, pulled the ball uh, more than almost any other team. So I don't know if they just put that that that, that people in place or if it's – I think my my theory is it's sitting there. It's, you're looking at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you, keep, you can't unsee it. It's just <laughs> there. It's just on you. <laughs> so, like, even if you don't – say like in the hitter meeting, like I'm trying to go oppo, you know, if, if the hitter, if the pitcher is like pitching you outside and you see the green monster, you're like, let me just hit this one off the monster, <laughs> which is cool for hits. And so maybe we will see Cassis, you know, have some 330 BABIPs and, and maybe some 280 batting averages and stuff like that. Uh, but it, it's not the best uh, for homers. Well, maybe it's more for a varied approach, right? You can do a two strike situation, then you think, all right, I'm fine going oppo here. This is going to work just fine. Mm -hmm. Talked about it a little bit with Spencer Steer uh, changing up his approach. He, he'd he actually be in tier three among first basemen. Again, Spencer Steer qualifies at so many places. You know, <laughs> you could talk about him on almost every position preview. Uh, but this group includes Spencer Torkelson, Yandy Diaz, Josh Naylor, and Christian Encarnacion Strand. So a really interesting group. We'll start with Torkelson. I kind of, I kind of just real quick, I kind of want to get a first baseman before this. I think this is something I completely agree with you on. And the reason is you start to see warts in each of these players, even yeah. though there are a lot of things they do well. Torkelson's yeah. rookie season, <laughs> it, it was like, it was like watching someone start an old snowblower on a five degree day. <laughs> oh god! It was it's just it was just painful. It was like wait, yeah. that thing should work. Why, why isn't this working? Like, it's meant that thing to work. work. Like, his tools should work in the big leagues. He should hit for power right away, and he got to it. He, he got to it in twenty three. And I think he's happened. a little bit of a lesson that like Max EV is powerful for rookies because you know eight percent barrel rate, but a one eleven point five Max EV. You're like, there's more power in there than an eight percent barrel rate. Yeah, and we just had to be a little patient, and and I think it's it's working pretty well for him now. I think similar to Cassis, you know, twenty five percent K rate, that's fine. Uh, barrel rate jumped up to fourteen percent. I have no doubt about his playing time at all. Like that little kernel of doubt about Cassis versus lefties. Torkelson's a righty. I don't think they're going to give him really any days off. He's going to play as long as he's healthy. He's probably a little more pull happy than Tristan Cassis, which makes me think that you Homer. trust that power a little bit more, right? But like you a, feel better. Tough park though, too. Tougher park. Lineup's not quite as good, at least until they bring a few more of those prospects up. We've talked about Keith and uh, Justin Henry Malloy. Mm. I think Cassis belongs ahead of Torkelson, but if we were in like a home run derby situation, I think I'd completely understand why everybody would want Torkelson over Cassis. I think Torque is 
maybe torque or nailer but torque torque is probably i maybe i go nailer torque i probably go nailer torque but the the these two are acceptable but if we have our our, our framework someone suggested last instead of last i kind of like last because lassie i've i've been watching shetland which is just a ridiculous it's just don't i'm not suggesting you should watch it it's like it's one of those things that my wife and i watch where you don't have to work our brains too hard it's like murder mystery in scotland show you know and we just like look up every once in a while and say like what did he just say like the, the accents are funny <laughs> i think that's why we watch it plus murder mysteries are kind of fun to be like oh, who did it who do you think did it and then see the reveal you know um but uh but anyway watch last one. watch the last murder mystery <laughs> last works too um i think that uh, torkelson and nail are, are kind of my last in terms of starting first baseman and I think you could be okay with both of them, but um, you know the park and the batting average last year, and uh, you know the forty-seven percent fly ball rate and the two seventy BABIP. I'm not sure he's ever going to have a good batting average. And so what we have is a Pete Alonso type who does not quite have the same raw power as Pete Alonso. He's more of a pull guy. Uh, he's in a similar maybe park situation, worse lineup situation. Uh, but I can see why sometimes people make the the Alonzo comparison because he's going for homers. Yeah, fifty point four percent hard hit rate, fourteen point one percent barrel rate. I, I thought maybe Christian Walker, but I think there's more power than there is with Walker. I think Walker might have a better average floor at least at present. Yeah, so you could you could talk yourself into one more level power wise for Torkelson. Um, I just I worry that the approach is going to be as you described it, one that keeps the average down for a long time. Good all around player, uh, no complaints at all. It, yeah, I, I think he's acceptable as your your starting first baseman. But I want someone from the earlier group. I, I kind of want to go out and and get one of Harper Olson, one of those elite elite guys. I, I mean, kinda, they just they give you so much. I mean, just think about the difference between having Bryce Harper and Josh Naylor. I know it's ridiculous and it's like a hundred picks or whatever, but like you're 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 hoping for you know similar average, you know, seven stolen bases, ten stolen bases, less like 10, 10 fewer homers, like like you're gonna get none of the R runs and RBI juice. <laughs> you're you're you can when you when you when you buy a Torkelson or you buy a Naylor, you can be like, I just got Bryce Harper like ten rounds later, but you didn't. You definitely <laughs> you didn't. Can, you you can say I I just got Pete Alonso, you know, in the thirtieth round. You didn't. <laughs> I I think there's someone in the next tier that I like just as much as Torkelson, which is probably making me not want to pay full price for Torkelson. I, I think Reese Hoskins can do everything Spencer Torkelson does and maybe even a little bit more like maybe just a, a tick more in the batting average department we don't know where he's going to play in 2024 yet plenty of places where I think he'd fit and, and be just fine uh, coming off an ACL tear so you do have to be mindful of that but I think once he has a team there's a chance Hoskins ADP creeps up and he joins the back of this tier like if, you, if you told me uh, Naylor versus Hoskins becomes an ADP toss-up that wouldn't be that surprising Projections already say, you know, that's that's where he should be. So I bet you that ADP does rise. And if it's Milwaukee, as is one of the main rumors and is a huge fit, um, you know, I told you we're going to talk, talk about Jake Bowers. It's coming. Uh, but if it's Milwaukee, then I think that's a great fit for him power wise. Um, so, yeah, Hoskins. The one thing that's interesting about Naylor is just that th his particular skill set, I do not think has a I can get this later. Uh, corollary i'm just sort of scanning but like who later is going to get you 10 stolen bases i Jake i know i, I know we're, we're living life in the anyone almost anyone can get bags i don't trust josh naylor's stolen bases you don't I, no i mean i know he gets six back in 2022 it just doesn't seem like that's gonna be part of his game for a long time hmm. i think i think the thing that makes Naylor really interesting is these always kept the K rates down. Yeah. And now we've seen a little more consistency with the power. Barrel rates have been okay. Really kind of three years running. He's been right around league average or a tick better. So that's good to see that floor being up. Uh, I think the playing time super safe. Just comes down to health. There's a little bit of health risk there. I think because of his track record with health, 
that's part of what makes me worry about the bags not being there. You're not drafting him for those bags necessarily, but that's a big part of the extra. Well, I'm just making the case to kind of be like, you know, if you are taking him as your last acceptable situation, um, the reason you would pick him uh, from out of this group that we're, that we've created is those stolen bases. Is it uh, similar to similar to Cabrian Hayes at the other corner? Like where you just kind of see that as a, well, I got to make up ground in that category and I'm not really worried about playing time. So this yeah. is okay. That's exactly the use case where I see you picking Naylor there is you took Matt Olson early on, you know, or you took, you took, uh, you know, who did I, I Vladimir Guerrero, but see, that's the same position. So like, well, who's a, a no stone base, like yonder, uh, um, uh, Jordan Alvarez, Jordan Alvarez, you took Jordan Alvarez and a, a starting pitcher and Corey Seager. Let's say you said Corey Seager, a starting pitcher, and you're on Alvarez. Totally possible beginning three. You would be wanting stolen bases with every pick going down the line, including your first baseman, probably. Yeah, you're probably going to look for some bags at first. You're going to probably look for some bags, even with one of your catchers, which that's, that's <laughs> what you did to that. yourself with that foundation. So you yeah, have exactly. that plan. <laughs> plan better be airtight. Uh, let's talk about Yandy Diaz for a second. I... I just want to know if we could even remotely trust the increased home run output. And <laughs> the projections say, yeah, you can. Steamer says, go ahead. 21 homers. Yeah, that, that's that's what the machine sees. I think the in order, I think the categories I like the most from Yandy are average, runs, RBIs, and then homers. Because if you look at his spray chart, got it up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube, it looks like he just hit more balls in the same spots like nothing changed it wasn't like he pulled the ball more the barrel rate went up but i can't quite figure out what happened the ground ball rate was still kind of the same as it's been for his career he still goes oppo a fair amount you can see it yeah like it it looks like he's the exact same guy from everything i've looked at so far it's still a good player but kind of like um I don't know, a better version of, of Ty France, maybe, or what people wanted Ty France to be. Yeah, and also... This is okay. You know, there were some splits uh, in his fly ball rate because we all fell over each other, you know, being like, oh my God, look at this, uh, you know, March and April, 38% fly ball rate, 43% ground ball rate. Uh, I'm, I don't even know, maybe I wrote something about it, but I remember just being like, wow, like he's like biggest ground ball rate changers you know he's on that leaderboard because even in in may he's still putting up a 32 percent fly ball rate but here's where the fly ball rate went after that 16.9 percent in june 23 percent in july uh, he's creeping back up at 29 and 31 in september but like those that june and july tells me like oh he, the old yandy's still in there <laughs> <laughs> the, the the 50 to 55 60 percent ground ball yandy is still in there and maybe you could make the case that now both guys are in there and he's he has both uh ways of being good um but yeah i think my personal projection would be more like 15 homers that just be safer i mean just look at his past you know 15 homers says he's made some progression but there's also going to be regression is there a, a foundational case where you'd be looking at Yandy where he goes and saying, yeah, this is it. This is the pick I needed. This is the guy that fits my team perfectly. Or do you think you wouldn't be you know, just chasing average in, in the middle rounds this way? Like th this seems like something you could hopefully it's avoid. A, it's a projections play. He's an $18 player uh, that goes, wh what are your ADP numbers around 140? Yeah, he is in the last seven days, 125. So by projections, 125? Yeah, up to 125. It'd be Yandy versus Ketel Marte if you're going to a different position. And ahead of Naylor and ahead of Torkelson? Behind Torkelson, but ahead of Naylor. Okay, well, his projection is better than Torkelson and Naylor's. And in fact, his projection is better than Cassis. And in fact, his projection is better than Walker's. Right. So I, I think, think it's because average is underrated all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Averages, uh, people don't think enough about average. That's one thing. And uh, and then two, like, you know, they're putting him in for 672 plate appearances. So that's a, that's a double-edged sword, which is, uh, if he does get to that, then he's a great projections play. But maybe knowing Tampa 
And even knowing Andy's own injury history, maybe that's an aggressive plate appearance projection. So maybe you um, you could use Fangraph's depth chart uh, maybe as a projection. They have 630 plate appearances. Or maybe you, in your head, just take $3 off that thing and say, you know what? He's just in the group with Torkelson and Naylor. Uh, and I'm just going to put him in a threesome at the top of my queue. And uh, maybe that means I can wait another round and pick something I need else here and just take whichever of those three th first basemen is available to me, which will probably be Andy. You know, and when the when the pick comes back to me, the other player in this tier, Christian Encarnacion Strand. We talked about Noel V. Marte and concerns about just how the Reds might mess with his playing time if everyone's healthy, which stinks because I think Noel V. Marte is a very good player. I, I just I just don't like the setup right now. Do you have any worries about Encarnacion Strand for similar reasons? Because I think he has even greater defensive limitations. I know they've moved him around both, I think, in the, in the Twins organization and the Reds organization. He's played both corner infield spots. I think he's made a little bit of a, an occasional appearance in the outfield, but that's like a handful of games at most. This looks like a DH first base guy that just mashes his way into the lineup. Do you trust the playing time enough to take him in this range? I think so. I mean, he's just, he's like the best pure slugger, I think, of all the, you know, if you think about Steer and McLean, you know, these guys, I mean, Ellie De La Cruz maybe, but he also has the, the, the huge ground ball rate. So in terms of like someone who is likely, you know, to hit 35 homers at some point in his career, and maybe even this year, he's like the only guy on the Reds, right? I mean, Ellie has to make Ellie. it. Has to make a like an adjustment to get there, and totally could. I'm not saying he can't, but like, just without many adjustments, and kind of on Strand, put him in there for a full year. He's the guy right now that could hit 35 homers. I think that's fair. I think what's really interesting about the projection and why he probably is lagging in terms of his ceiling at the moment, aside from the questions about how they make the pieces fit, he's only projected at 406 yeah. plate appearances right now. Which is fair to, because you have to you, on the projections you have to fit in Noel Marte, Matt McLean, Elliot de la Cruz, Jonathan India, and Heimer Candelario in this infield situation, right? But if you play the, the Steamer six hundred game, take the six hundred plate appearance projection and look at that, he's going to leapfrog a bunch of the guys in this tier mm -hmm. and maybe even move ahead of some of the bottom tier two guys. I could see him maybe creeping ahead of Cassis even if you equalize playing time. I like him as a, a little bit more in shallower league. So if you're in a 10 or 12 team league and you're looking for a corner infielder with a lot of upside, um, I like him better in those situations because then you can cut him if he's not playing every day, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, if you need to depend on him for plate appearances, how do you feel about him in like a you know, weekly 15 team NFC sort of format like? Do you want to depend on that? It would make me a little bit nervous to see that projected $3 value going around the same place as Bohm for 10 bucks and that Vinny Pascantino projected for 14 bucks, Yandy projected for 18 bucks. Like that's a really little number there to to get in terms of the projections at least. I think because the number is small for reasons that I completely understand, I I just think the number's a little bit wrong. Mm. Um I think you can at pick 150, you can take a shot like this. I think people start to take shots more comfortably in this range. You see Wyatt Langford, who we'll talk about on the outfield preview. He goes at pick 150. Yeah, uh, we see CES is closer to everyday playing time than Langford. As much as I like Langford, like you know, they could yeah. he could start the minors in the minors again. I mean, with Jake Berger, who we talked about in the third base preview, like more playing mm. time projected. But I like Encarnacion Strand better than Jake Berger. If you're just taking a swing for some power because yeah. I just don't think you're giving up nearly as much an average with they the could just give him DH. I think they definitely could do that. It, Why? it bothers me how much I like the Reds young core of hitters. Like what, what an amazing trade. I know Tyler Malley got hurt and that always like skews the analysis of the trade, but they got Spencer steer and Christian and Carnacion strand for Tyler Malley, which is just mm. huge for them. Like to get two more guys like that and, uh, to tack it on to the other key pieces they already had. Like, what a great, great sequence for the Reds to do this as quickly as they did. That's true. I I don't like it as a 
uh, fan of another team in the division. I mean, I know why they do a projection where they they put Candelario and Fraley and India and Steer and Ellie De La Cruz and Nick Martini and Tyler Stevenson in a DH, but <laughs> uh, on some level, I'm like, you know, take a couple percentages away from each of those guys and just give it to CES, who I've watched him, you know, do infield, and I I believe the glove is not good. I'm not even sure it's first baseman. Is it even is it even that ridiculous to have six guys that you want to play almost every day for five spots? Like you don't really squeeze anyone that badly if you just take a little bit of playing time away from everyone when they're healthy. Yeah. It's not as crowded as it could be. The next group, Vinny Pasquantino, Reese Hoskins, and Nathaniel Lowe, all kind of going in the 150 to 200 range. I think with Pasquantino, I I love the skills. I just I, he's coming off a torn labrum in his right shoulder. I I, I would rather I'd rather take the playing time risk of Encarnacion Strand than yeah. the health risk of Pasquantino. I think he's a player I really like long term. I hope he comes back and crushes it. But he's more on my radar for 2025 purposes or if I'm not playing for this season in a keeper dynasty league. Sure. Would love well, to have what he brings in the future. Even then, I think the time to uh, I could be wrong. Maybe he just hits the ground running. He's young. You know, younger people with surgeries, especially labor surgeries, have better outcomes and stuff. But what I assume will happen, it'll be a little bit slower, especially in the colder months. He'll be a little bit slower in the first couple of months. I think the maybe the best time uh, to try and acquire Vinny Pascantino will be in like May um, this year. So uh, maybe he keep your powder dry and and let him struggle for a couple of months. He's um. He's progressing well if you follow him on like, Twitter or Instagram. Like he's he's hitting. Like it's not it's not like he's just doing rehab. So things appear to be going really well for him physically. I think I might be willing to change my tune if we get to spring training. He's out there every single day. They're not they're not treating him any differently than anybody else. That would be a really clear indication to me that the shoulder is less of an issue than I think it is right now. So things are pointing in the right direction. It'd be nice but. to see some like spring training at a stat cast park where they're like, and he hit the ball 111. Yeah, that'd be nice to see too. Uh, Bowman Paredes do go in this cluster. We talked about them in the third base ep- episode, but the love for Reese Hoskins, he he would be the, the Willie Adames of this episode, the guy that I think is just an amazing value. It's weird that the the players that I've liked as amazing values throughout these infield previews so far, they're all slight risks in batting average. But I think it's getting reliable power and run production at discounted prices across the board. I think that's what Hoskins is going to bring to the table. I, I'd, I'd pay probably 30, 40, 50 picks higher for what he brings. And I, I'm sure I'll have to do that in March, but I love getting the discount right now. Yeah, what's interesting that uh, from the projection standpoint is that Steamer is getting into single uh, dollar players, a single like you know what's a uh, you know what I'm saying like yes, single not digit. double digit, single digit, single digit dollar guys. So we're talking about six and eight dollar players here, and um, you know Reese Hoskins. A- after you sort of hit that Paredes bomb level, the only uh, double digit guys uh, after that are guys who do things that w- that are guys who don't do what we want first baseman to do. So what you have left is, uh, is well, Reese Hoskins is a health thing, but you have Nate Lowe, Andrew Vaughn, and Josh Bell. Those are the only uh, double-digit first basemen that go after that sort of bone paradis, that go after uh, the 200 uh, level other than Hoskins. And so uh, I think that the, uh, the, the hate, I understand it, you know, with Nate Lowe, the, the, you want him to pull the ball. You want to shake him and, and tell him to pull the ball. And he pulls the ball less every year. Um, but, you know, he's been uh, something like 20% better in league average, uh, you know, for the last 20% for his career. He's, he's not going to change unless he struggles harder, you know. Um, and so you just have to sometimes look at the at the positive of it, which is probably going to hit around 20 homers, probably going to have a good batting average. He's probably going to fill check the boxes and fill, play every day. Um, and, you know, the same can be traded with Vaughn. I think with Vaughn, maybe the hope is uh, he's a little bit younger. So maybe there's a chance that – and he also was only 103 WRC plus uh, last year and for his career. There might be a chance that, like, the light bulb goes on and he's like, I need to pull the ball. 
to be better. You know, you can't just sort of rest on his laurels and be like, this is great. Everything is great. It's kind of been okay. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so the, maybe there's a chance that Vaughn pulls the ball more this year, maybe new, new leadership, maybe a new, maybe he gets a new voice, um, f- from the analytics side or something like that. Um, I think there's a little bit of hope that Vaughn might change things, but as it is Vaughn bell and Lowe have flawed approaches that have led to decent outcomes and seem like they're going to play a lot. So they're just, I guess the word is oatmeal. They're the oatmeal. Still oatmeal. And yeah. there's, I, I think of this group, tier five, you know, Ryan Mountcastle, Andrew Vaughn, Justin Turner, Anthony Rizzo, Jose Abreu still kind of fits here. And then Josh Bell. Bell seems really discounted relative to the others. I think Rizzo. But they're all the- like 260, 25. Yeah. I, I, it's almost like who is most likely to fail. When you're looking no. at oatmeal, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That was just a, that was just like a response. I don't know. Nah, it's, it's, that's I think be. that's why he falls. There's something in you know, the park, and then the, Bell has these. It seems like Bell just has these long streaks of where he's just not almost not usable. Yeah, he does have the most unusual track record of up and down performances for someone that I've always said doesn't really have like she. You expect players who strike out a lot to be feast or yeah. Feast. Yeah, he's not that. He runs. It's like the ground ball problem. And, he just starts yeah, yeah. rolling the ball over, and I, I've I've watched him a fair amount of these stops, and it's like it's the rolling the ball over problem. It's he puts it in a play, but he just rolls over the top of it. This is pretty wild too. He last season, Josh Bell at two forty seven, three twenty five, four nineteen, pretty close to what we're used to in his like down relative down years. Had a ten percent barrel rate. It's fine. It's good. Highest Realm, pull rate of his career. <laughs> yeah, like he did some things well. Somehow he only scored 52 runs. Oh, well, that's 617 plate appearances. Cleveland, and, and Cleveland Miami. plus Miami. Yeah. So uh, I think that's part of what's um, holding him back. Projections are a little more optimistic in, in past seasons, too. Like just looking at his previous stops, usually you get 70 plus runs, at least that many RBIs. So maybe you get a little bit more in those counting stats. It's going to depend on the K rate coming back down. The K rate jumped up to 21.7%, which isn't alarming, but it was about a six percentage point increase from 2022. That could be the beginning of, of some problems, I guess. I just Bell. at 31, you know, like with Vaughn, I'm like, well, he's 25 and two years under his belt. Like maybe he can take that extra leap. I kind of in this group want a little bit of an eye for what could he do better. Mm-hmm. And I just don't, I think at this point I'm out on Bell making any, you know, I guess there's, you can point to that weird, you know, career high and pull percentage and his four year low in ground ball rate and be like, yeah, he's going to pull fly balls. But uh, I feel like there's a little bit of that, you know, fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times situation here where I'm like, I kind of, I'm kind of out. I'm good with Rizzo at his price. I think the numbers pre-concussion were pretty good. I think he's... I'll take him on. over Jose Abreu in a second. I'll take him over Abreu and Bell. I take him over Turner, even though I think Turner's average floor is higher. Rizzo versus Vaughn. I'd probably even take Rizzo over Vaughn. Uh, better park, better lineup. Well, projections say you're wrong. Well, sometimes projections are wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's just always, it always makes me feel like... Um, the, it's always sunny uh, scene when when Mac is like science is wrong sometimes and it's just like oh boy <laughs> that's an all time favorite always sunny well scene Rizzo today. like I think you you can almost wipe last year off the books I mean literally was hurt you know concussion wise but just weird things were like he gets five stolen bases every year and then in the year that they make it super easy to steal bases he steals zero. You know, and in in terms of barrel rate, like his, a four year worst. In terms of max EV, a career worst. You know, in terms of strikeout rate, a career worst. So, in terms of walk rate, a career worst. I feel like it, so many career worst. I know he's thirty four, but I think the Yankees are going to run him out there, and you know, I think that the a lot of it is to, to do with the the. Um, the the concussion so uh, I, I i can get with rizzo over most of these cats uh, vaughn uh, i just I, I feel like the the pull rate is inching forward and there could be an outcome where vaughn puts it all together 
and I like that age difference. I mean, Vaughn's 25 and Rizzo's 34. So there's that's that that's weighing on my mind. I, I think I go Vaughn over Rizzo. Ryan Mountcastle is also in this group. And earlier in the winter, I kind of pointed out, I just liked him at the price because I think if he stays in Baltimore, he's still going to play in a really good lineup. Like if they keep him, they must like him enough to play him. If they trade him, someone else likes him enough to play him. I just it, I don't know why I've, I've put myself into what is probably a logical fallacy. Uh, <laughs> I look at the barrel rates, consistently good, three years running. The only thing that's a little bit strange, hit the ball on the ground a little bit more last year, and the pull rate has actually been going in the wrong direction for Mount Castle. And I'm wondering, as a right-handed hitter, if he tried to adjust to the ballpark last year, and, oh. and that was part of why the power Looking at Mount Baltimore bit. out there. Yeah, like, maybe he was hitting to the park a little bit, but... I. Part of the reason I like him, if he stays too, is that that lineup keeps getting better. I'm buying the Orioles with the, the big up arrow that what we saw last year is the beginning of a longer run of sustained success. And I think that's where the you know the 70 plus runs, 70 plus RBIs, and those are pretty easily there for Mount Castle if he stays in Baltimore. I don't think that the poor uh, plate discipline is going to, uh, you know, come to haunt him, you know, in the next couple of years either. Um I think the 470 plate appearances last year was a little bit worrisome. You you keep talking about they trust to play him, but that's not how I remember it. I thought he was hurt last year. Wasn't did he yeah. miss time because of an injury? They actually started like playing him less. I mean, Ryan O'Hearn was a really pleasant surprise for them last year. Yeah, he he had vertigo in early June, and he was in Mount a slump Castle before did. that too. Yeah, just looking at the rotowire. Yeah, but how about injuries? In September, in September, sure. he had 48 plate appearances. He had a shoulder injury. Oh, he did? Yeah. Okay. So he had vertigo and a shoulder injury, which kind of explains okay. a lot. I feel like hitting baseballs with vertigo would be really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. It seems like something that pops up in baseball more than, like, I, I don't think I've ever, I don't think any of my friends have ever had vertigo. Mm, um, but, like, didn't have Steve Sachs have vertigo? Like, I can think of a few baseball players who had vertigo. Steve Sachs, I think. Uh, There's a goalie in the NHL, a prominent goalie a few years ago that had it. Uh, yeah. Lucille Two, an arrested development. <laughs> <laughs> she had vertigo. Okay. <laughs> like, that's just, it's, it sounds like a horrible thing to deal with, especially for a professional athlete, for anyone. It sounds terrifying. You're just like nauseous and, and dizzy. I mean, your, your whole like baseline of things just being steady is completely yeah. thrown off. How are you supposed to hit a baseball or stop a hockey puck when nothing is steady? Like yeah, I mean, they talk about being connected and and you know being in the ground. And, yeah, yeah, and know. if the ground is just like leaving you, like that doesn't seem <laughs> great. So I think I'm willing to give Mount Castle a pass for what happened to him last year. That's uh, a rough year. Yeah, and you know I think that this group uh, also. It gets pretty ugly after it. I mean, I start seeing a bunch of negatively uh, uh, projected uh, players. Um, and then even the ones that have positive projections down below this group, I'm not that into. You know, there's the Wilmer, Flo like Wilmer Flores uh, and the Lantway Jr. are like projected as three or four dollar players and supposedly could be, you know, a CI for a 15 team league, but you'd better be daily league, man. Because uh, and also just given their skill sets and their age, I'm I'm not not looking for much upside out of those guys, you know. So I don't know. I, I did have a hard hit rate thing. Put throw that one up. <laughs> we need There's to work be. on our our signal for when the graphics <laughs> go on the screen. This is the ugliest of the graphics today. Um, I'm, I'm learning more about graphics. If everyone's interested in that, but uh, it, I wanted to throw this up there because you can use hard hit rate to to mine. Um, I think for some cheap players, and I mean at least they do something that's really important in baseball, which hit the ball hard. So on this list, you see Yandy Diaz is second uh, among first basemen and hard hit rate last year. That's pretty cool. Um, then you also see Michael Bush on here. So maybe that's someone you take a shot on instead of a Wilmer Flores or the Montway Jr. who don't hit the ball hard and don't play every day. Uh, but you also see Brandon Drury, uh, Andrew Vaughn on here. So 
this is a, a, a good group. I would like uh, my first baseman to be in this uh, in this collection of bats just because I like people to hit the ball hard. Um, so, you know, in terms of uh, sleepers, you can gain, gain off this. If you think Ryan or Hearn is uh, going to, you know, strong arm his way into, you know, you know, 80% of the at-bats at DH, uh, then this stat uh, speaks to you. But Michael Bush is getting the first shot at first base in Chicago. Uh, and Brandon Drury is also another cheap first baseman. Yeah, Brandon Drury, I think, is just a, a more solid player than he gets credit for. That's, that's Every time I've looked at his numbers this winter, I've thought, yeah, this actually works around pick 200, and you get a little bit of position flexibility to go along with it. Uh, we were talking before the show. There's a long list of players. So on the screen, it says Wilmer Flores to Joey Votto. That, it's just first base eligible players beyond pick 300. A uh, whole bunch of interesting names. Ty France going to drive line this offseason after seeing what JP Crawford did a year ago following a winter and spent at drive line bets. And uh, I mean, with, with France, like I wasn't psyched about him last year where he was going kind of in the, the Yandy range. I think if, if memory serves me correct, kind of in that pick 140, 150 range. But everyday playing time has been there three years in a row. It could still be there this year. He's always done a good job keeping strikeouts under control. It's been like 17.6%. Last year was his highest in three years. Usually he's under that. If he starts hitting the ball harder, lifting the and, ball a little bit in more. The air, yeah. I, we, we, we saw him hit 20 homers in 2022 w- without that. So there's already a nice discount, even without making changes, so long as the playing time sticks. And there's a chance he gets a tick better in the power department. So I'm kind of interested in France as just a, a late corner filler going after pick 300. Yeah. I think that, I think bat speed could help him in all and fall facets of the game because, you know, 38% hard hit is, is below average for a first baseman, honestly. Um, and yet he still has a, he last year had a one twelve point seven max EV. So the raw power is there, but you know, getting him to a point where he can uh, manage higher bat speed on the average swing. Um, I think would be would be a big deal for him, um, and I like I like the K percentage. So you sold me on on Ty France in, in this late grouping. I think you see you know Cronenworth and DJ LeMahieu here, and in every every few years you worry more about it. Like this profile, like for DJ LeMahieu, he might play a lot again. Got the 562 plate appearances last year. Do you think he goes? close to that number again this year for the Yankees or do you think they've got enough young players coming up where they can start to taper that off even more um where did he play mostly last year I'm trying to pull up the page he played a little more at third than at first 56 games at first and 69 at third Uh, the reason I ask that is because I, I think that I don't know that they have a great solution at third base. I'm not a big uh, Oswald Peraza or Oswald Cabrera stand. And um, so I think that if I was running this team, the regular lineup would be Gigi LeMahieu, Andrew, you know, Andrew Volpe, Lever Torres, Anthony Rizzo, and Cabrera and Peraza would be not necessarily even the kind of utility guys that I'm trying to get in the lineup all the time. Hmm. You know, more like the utility guys that just, we use when someone needs a blow, you know? So that's, the, that's how I'd run things. I think it makes sense. I think the problem we're running into with LeMahieu, and it's always been there, is the ground ball rate is still really high, still sitting at 55%. So the, the power you see, the 15 home runs last year, which is a four four year high for him, that's as good as it's going to get. As long as he keeps hitting the ball on the ground that much, given his age, it seems unlikely he's going to make that change at this stage of his career, but could just be a, a useful fills the stat sheet sort of guy for you given where he goes. Cronenworth is just an afterthought. Every time we talk about Cronenworth, it's that the Padres seemingly we want to take him with his contract and just get rid of him by either adding a player or whatever it is they have to do. There's also a scenario in which they just have to play him because he's there and they can't find a suitor. I see similar kind of like low K rate, questionable power, 
doesn't have the batting average track record that LeMahieu very similar had projection career. to LeMahieu, even though they're not quite the same player. Right, like they've LeMahieu with age has turned into Cronenworth in his late twenties, which is kind of weird. <laughs> um, I, I, I one thing that I do, I want to say that there's it's a little bit of an edge case, but um, their dual eligibilities is interesting. So in even in a 12 team league where you might say these guys aren't draftable, what's interesting is they might be draftable on the bench because the batting average could be okay. You know, a little bit of power, a little bit of speed, uh, team situation might be okay. Corner and middle for both. So that's theoretically four positions they could play for you. And the way that I could see it even working in a 10 team situation is head to head daily moves wouldn't it be nice to have one of these guys just to plug in on the days when somebody else isn't playing or someone is hurt on a, in a short-term manner you know just have a have a guy that just adds the plate appearances um and then in the draft and hold i think you know these guys are more interesting because they you know they can cover a couple positions for you in terms of eligibilities yeah you may have weeks where they're going to play five times and your alternative either isn't going to play at all or is a clear platoon bat and they're going to prove to be somewhat useful in those super deep formats uh, with LeMahieu, you do have to check the games played requirement in your league i think if you're on like a yahoo situation he does have that middle eligibility because he played nine games at second for leagues that require more he falls just a little bit short so just be mm. careful of that one uh, but cronenworth does have first and second pretty much everywhere just based on having at least 20 games at both of those spots whole bunch of bargain bin players here i'm going to reel off some names you tell me if you like any of these guys once i get through them rowdy Telez now in pittsburgh uh, you've got ella reese montero in colorado taking over at first base at least for now because cj crone is still a free agent Nolan Shaniel got to the big leagues really fast for the Angels. Looks like he's got a long window for a lot of playing time. Limp stick. So far, I said, did you think there's anything from college, minor leagues that gives you some hope that the major league numbers could still improve in terms of the contact no. quality for Shaniel? No. You're just out. If there is anybody that needs batted ball, uh, 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 weighted ball training and 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 bad bat speed training out there, it is him. Hmm. 103.5 max EV is not playable in the major leagues, is my opinion. Do you know who has a higher max EV than Nolan Chanuel? Tony Kemp. <laughs> Good one. I'm trying to get Nick Madrigal's <laughs> page up. Oh. Nick Madrigal has three miles an hour on Nolan Chanuel. That's surprising. I, that, yeah, I should tell you something. That's very surprising. <laughs> it's not a first baseman for me. So, uh, but the stick. I mean, I guess I don't know what he's been doing. Maybe he's working out. Maybe, maybe just even just a weight training can do it. But as as is, I'm not in. Um, continue. I mean, Elu Harris Montero, I'm interested in a little bit just because uh, the, the the play for me is playing when he's in Chicago. I mean, it's, I mean, in Colorado, it's not it's not brain science. It's. Risky only because we've seen him strike out a lot. 307 plate appearances last year, 36.2% K rate, and it's not with a big walk rate. It's like if he's just working the count too much and uh, running into that problem. So you do have some it's a high risk, high reward. Lose, lose the job possibility here. Man, he tore up AAA for the time he was there again last year, though. And he, he ripped up AAA in 2022. I know it's a PCL, some really, really hitter friendly environments. Also like way lower strikeout rates. You know, from most of those places. So, yeah, my hope I, is he comes back with sort of a twenty-eight percent strikeout rate, and you know, basically keeps the job. The cost is so low, you, even in like a fifteen-team league where you have cuts. I think I'd actually throw a late flyer at him to see what happens, and he's an early season him, drop. I took him in my uh, in my draft and hold to be my third first baseman. Uh, my first baseman are, and I waited on that because I had Vlad Guerrero and Paul Goldschmidt as my two first basemen. So Eli Harrisman and Montero and Ryan Noda are my, were my uh, late picks. And I got Noda in the 32nd and Montero in the 27th. The 27th round um, of a 15-team league, that's uh, so deep that a lot of people are listening don't even, their drafts won't go that deep. What do you do with Kyle Manzardo? Had him on the show back during the fall league. He's got an ADP sitting around pick 330 right now. Earliest he's gone in the last seven days is 298. I keep looking at that depth chart in Cleveland and thinking like 
he's probably the starter at first base. Like you pair him with Josh Naylor, they share first base in DH and, and Menzardo's there to just make that lineup better like right away. I thought that was a pretty interesting trade between the Rays and Guardians at the deadline last year when the Rays acquired Aaron Savali from Menzardo. Yeah, uh, I was really impressed with him. And I don't know if people heard that episode and they can they can listen back. I was just really impressed with him in terms of like, we gave him some fairly hard questions, I think. We were asking him to talk about his flaws. And he did. And he was open about them. And then I we talked about that. It's basically high fastballs is, you know, a little bit of a, a, an issue for him. But we also watched him, you know, play and we watched him in the home run derby. And I swear I saw him hit some high fastballs. <laughs> so and I don't see his swing as like when I watch his swing, it doesn't look to me like a Kyle Schwarber esque swing. No, it you doesn't know? look like a long swing. It, and it's not like it's not it's kind of it's not loopy. It's not like an uppercut type thing. So um and I think that you know, having a high fastball issue by the time you're in triple a for 400 plate appearances the book is out and they're trying to fill it up now the question is can triple a pitchers execute the game plan the same way major league pitchers will right are they even able are their quality of fastballs as good that they are throwing up there so obviously the book could be out in triple a and and it could be worse for him in the major leagues but i i think that even if his strikeout rate jumps to 23% I think he has enough going for him in terms of plate discipline, uh, raw power, pretty good hard hit. Like, I, I, I think he can he can handle having a twenty three percent strikeout rate. Yeah, I, I think he'd be potentially twelve team relevant if he has the job on opening day. He could at least be a corner for formats like that. Because I think there's a chance the the average comes out a bit better than we saw at AAA last year. I know there was an injury. There's some some things going on that caused that uh, little dip in production. Also. Triple-A last year, automated ball and strike system. There's some weird stuff that happened to a lot of hitters with that, so you have to be mindful of that uh, as you kind of look back at those numbers. So definitely like him where he's going right now, and I agree with you. I thought he had a lot of great answers to some of the questions we were asking him during that interview back in uh, November. The other veterans that are on this list, we'll reel off a few more names. Brandon Belt still looking for a job. Joey Votto still looking for a job. Carlos Santana, also a free agent. I've got a bunch of ghosts of, of Brewers first base past uh, on here too. And one in the present, Jake Bowers, who has outfield eligibility. He's just in this end game cluster. Is there anybody you see going super late that you think is worth the flyer, either for mono leagues, draft and holds, or possibly as someone that could creep up a little bit and at least become a top 400 overall consideration as we get closer to March? I'm a little bit interested in CJ Crone as the youngest of this sort of jobless group. Um, best bail rate of the jobless group other than, I mean, I can't find Belt on here. Maybe Belt has a better bail rate. Um, and actually Jake Bowers has a better bail rate. But, you know, in terms of like demonstrated track record, he beats a lot of those. Like, I'm surprised that, you know, Milwaukee went for Bowers over Crone, but I guess Crone's asking price might be higher. Bowers uh, was a million dollars is his pay for this year. Um, I like Bowers' uh, barrel rate. I like that he kind of revamped his game and is a totally different player. He used to be a guy who didn't strike out much but didn't hit the ball hard, and now he strikes out a ton and hits the ball hard. <laughs> What's worrisome for me is that, like, the overall results aren't that good either way. Like, when both approaches for Jake Bowers produced a below average bat. He was a 90 WRC plus guy last year. And for first base, the bar is like 105. You know, he's got to be better than average at first base. So uh, I know, uh, like I know in my heart that Milwaukee saw those barrel rates and it's like, you know, he's not going to have the same bat if he had last year. And if he keeps hitting the ball hard like this, he's going to be better than league average. And I get it. Um, but they can still cut him at a million dollars. I don't even sure he's going to make the big make the opening day roster. So Crone for me is uh, someone who could still end up in Milwaukee, you know, um, or Reese Hoskins, as we said earlier. Um, I'm interested in Crone and Belt. Uh, Belt is uh, not uh, as much of an everyday player. So Belt is 
someone who's they're buying him to be a part time DH at this point with the knees. Yeah, I think you. I feel like Crone them. might play more if he gets the job. You could you could put Crone in a situation health permitting. His back, I think, is the problem. Not as bad seemingly as Belt's knees, but you could see Crone getting over 500 plate appearances with Belt. The 400 we just saw with the Jays that kind of seems like that's the ceiling sort of expectation for him at this stage of his career. Yeah, I agree. And the K rate jump for Belt though, almost 35 percent last year. Yeah. And, and Noda, uh, Noda is a guy that, like I said, I took him. Uh, one thing I like about him is uh, I, he he puts really good at bats together. Like I watched a fair amount of him, and like you know, sixteen percent walk rate, thirty four percent strikeout rate. He does have some natural swing and miss, but he doesn't chase. He's he's not like super super passive, but he's I think he's doing the best uh, to get out of his skill set, and I think that. They don't really. I, yes, we talked about Jordan Diaz, and there's some other players on this team. Maybe he loses his job, but I think on this athletic squad, like he's just the regular first baseman. The other random player I like that has first base eligibility, he also has <laughs> shortstop eligibility. We didn't talk about him on the shortstop Whoa. preview. Who is this? Gabriel Arias. Oh, yeah. There's something popped on him uh, in my color coding. What was it? Barrels, he, I think. Barrels, yeah, no, he's green across the board except for chase and swing and miss. So he's aggressive in the zone, good barrel rate, max EV 114 for 46 percent hard hit rate. I mean, this is not a normal Cleveland player. That right. I, that concerns me a little bit. It's like <laughs> you know, like oh, what is Cleveland going to think? They're going to be like, well, dude, you strike out too much, and that's just not what we do. You don't belong here. <laughs> I, I think in terms of, of usage of leagues you'd be considering him in, like if you found value with Ezekiel Duran in 2023, you could find value with Gabriel Arias in 2024. Plays a bunch yeah. of positions, could pick up a few positions along the way, could be a guy that's on your roster for stretches and then off your roster again. But I just thought there was a little bit more there that he could still tap into. And it seems like the Guardians just like having him as someone they can slot in all over the place. Yeah, I, I don't think they're going to... I mean, is the possibility still there that they give him shortstop? Rokio has his flaws, I think, too. I I think it's Rokio. I think they're finally going to turn that over to Rokio. All right. You have to see what Rokio can do because you have 10 more shortstops in the org that are probably high A or above because that's... they just, they, like Everybody, they, they love shortstops. They basically are a shortstop factory and totally on purpose. It's totally like a, an ethos for them because they can trade them. They have more value in trades. And so uh, I think they do a lot of like being very intentional about who's at what level so they can give them as many at bats, uh, many reps at shortstop. Um, and then also intentional about how they teach them defense. They're, they're really have like a really strong defensive coaching um, standard in the organization. And so, you know, like just remember though, that for us on the outside, like that's nice that they do that and it's good for them to create value in trades and for the organization. Um, but just remember Tyler Freeman because, <laughs> you know, there's the way that this works is it's almost like their pitching production factory where they're like, let's take a guy with command, give him weighted balls, try to coach up the shapes. You know, maybe we get, uh, another Shane Bieber, or maybe we get uh, Josh Tomlin. You know, th- I think the situation here is like we're looking to coach up a Lindor or a, or a Jose Ramirez, but we might just end up with another Tyler Freeman who just makes contact, has good uh, ability to play short, but is not really relevant for fantasy purposes. And nobody, uh, I don't, I don't think a lot of people are clamoring to trade for him. Um, but it's it's still uh, like remember remember this name I guess he's projected for a double one hundred eight WRC plus like maybe somebody will trade for him to be their shortstop maybe maybe the uh, the Dodgers will pull Tyler Freeman out of their butts. Oh, I, I I actually think there's some stuff going on with Tyler Freeman in terms of the hard hit rate jumping up this past season that makes him kind of interesting. Steal some bases. He was fifteen for fifteen between AAA and the big leagues. Yeah. And hard hit is, is an improvement for him, for sure. Yeah, it's a big jump. So the K rate obviously came up, too, as he's moved through the system, but it's a pretty good hit tool. There there actually could be something there. He lifts it a little bit more, 
started you, locking again, a little like power. from a fancy standpoint that the bar that he has to clear is so high to be relevant mm-hmm. in most leagues. And then he, the crowd is like fairly crowded. Like they, they have an opportunity at shortstop. They let their shortstop go and they've got Tyler Freeman, Brian Rocchio and Gilbert Arias. And the, and the, the major, the, the 50% play, the 50% plus play, the, the, the smart play is that n- none of them are really great shortstops in any fantasy league. Yeah, I'm looking at the the list of prospects, and let's see, is it uh, it was was it Juan Brito they got in the the Nolan Jones trade? He's probably I mean, some of these guys end up playing second, some of these guys end up playing other spots entirely. But there's some excitement about Brito, but again, I just want to put it in in focus with like you know he kind of fits the same things that they've done in the past, which you know. 30% hard hit rate, 101.5 max EV, although that was a short playing time. Maybe he's got a little bit more power than the other guys, uh, but he fits right into the mold. Makes a lot of contact, walks, maybe questionable power. I guess their raw power is 40, 45 for him on fan graphs. I just, I don't, I don't understand what they see in most hitters. They just, they just <laughs> don't look at hitters the same way I do. It's the nice way. Nice I want some to hitters it. to hit the ball hard. <laughs> they, they they want hitters to hit the ball. That seems to be the difference. <laughs> yeah, I want you. I want them to do both. I, mean, I want hitters to hit the ball. I would rather the hit the ball and hit the ball hard. <laughs> yeah, at a certain point, just hitting the ball isn't quite enough. Uh, it's summary for first base. I think we said it along the way. Try to invest reasonably early. It's another position where I think because of the playing time and the way that some teams will mix and match, the longer you wait, the more you risk possibly losing a little bit of time. Uh, you also have the the lower average, uh, lower this OBP, is a, this is drop position, in the order problem. Yeah, this is, this is a position where uh, they do platoon. Mm-hmm. This is a position. It's not like shortstop. A late shortstop will still play every day. Almost every shortstop position, we're talking about maybe the Dodgers, like maybe there's two or three teams that have like a couple of players that might play shortstop, but I'm betting that Marco Luciano plays every day in San Francisco because he's the shortstop, you know, whereas first base in San Francisco is more indicative of like what the league does as a whole, which is like, well, it could be J.D. Davis and it could be Wilmer Flores and it could be Lamont Wade Jr. And, you know, that's that's I think the the, the ethos for most of the league. Definitely a spot where teams like to mix and match. And as a result, just make sure you don't get caught up in the middle late tiers with guys that lose that playing time. Uh, a couple of things as we go, you can get a subscription to The Athletic for $2 a month for the first year at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. We have a lot more to come as far as position previews go. Next week, we got catchers and UT players. Going to get through all of the outfield as well. So we'll whole bunch of players to discuss next That's week. Just three week. days of three days of outfield. Three days in the outfield. Yeah. It's gonna it's gonna be a fun. lot of players. Tons of players. So we got that. We got pitcher week coming up the following week. So all my ranks are gonna be fun closers. this year. You yeah. know they're gonna be fun. I, it's a I, challenge. The it's uh they they're gonna be interestingly formatted and I'm writing blurbs uh for the pitchers this year for the first time. So and then I hopefully uh have some some tricks up my sleeve with a, some stuff plus improvement and some improvement in the projections. So uh, that's coming soon. Working hard All on good it. Good things. All very good things. Theathletic.com slash rates and barrels gets you in the door on Twitter. You can find Eno at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek Van Riper. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you next week. Thanks for listening.